world, but he wasn't of the world. I think loving the world, loving people and not the sin and not the chaos that the world can bring makes all the difference in the world. I mean, let's understand this. As Christians, our main objective is trying to emulate God or Christ as He example on this earth. When He walked this earth over 2,000 years ago, our job is to emulate Him the best that we can. And we ask ourselves at the end of the day, why do we look like the world so much and less like Christ? I think it's a mindset. I think it's a heart set. I think it's what we're seeing, what we're hearing, what we put ourselves around. And the Good Life series, is it's all about that. It's like Jesus did not let the world define Him or the good life, what the good life was. Jesus, didn't let, Jesus knew what the good life was. He came from the Father, as the Father expressed His love on the world, came to this earth, became flesh like you and me, and endured temptations and trials. He beat the devil. He was fully, fully in God's will. But did that eliminate the devil? No. He was still there with him. He still led him up to the mountain, didn't he? He still tempted him. He still put family and friends in Jesus' way. He still took friends of Christ and portrayed him. And used betrayal as a means to lure Christ away from God. It did none of it work. None of it worked. And the Bible says to put on the mind of Christ. To put on the mind of Christ. Why then is Christians so much like the world? I, it's because we're allowing the world to define us. And we're allowing the world to define what things are to us. What the good life is. What, uh, uh, For example, let me give you this example. Um, I wanted more material on it. I might speak about it later uh, down the road. But this week, I was listening to the radio and heard something that blew my mind. It really got me enraged in, in uh, righteous indignation. It got me like I, what I like to call flipping table mad, like Jesus was when he walked into the saints, into the church, and, and seen what he's seen. I heard on the radio that you know how the LGBT has sought recognition, uh, notoriety. They wanted a place in society. They wanted to be recognized. Not only that, they wanted rights. Uh, they wanted uh, uh, same-sex uh, partners, marriages, and stuff. And not only that, they wanted to adopt kids and bring them up under the umbrella of, of uh, uh, you know, two men or two women kind of relationships. And all that happened, right? Well, now, now, pedophiles are seeking notoriety through the LGBT. They want... To be a group within LGBT to, to be recognized and have certain rights. Guys, this is ludicrous. Where we're going to start the record. Listen, it is a, it's a, it's a sentence. It really is. But you know what? It started with a snare of the devil. It started with some alone time. It started with some freedom. And then they let their fingers do the talking on the computer. And before you know it, they started getting into a sexually immoral, immoral lifestyle, a second life. And it started there. And then it transformed into something that wasn't pleasurable then. And they had to do more and more to get pleasure, pleasure out of it. And they became pedophiles. That's it. To so you and me in the Christian world, is a stronghold through the devil that's got them by the roots. And only Christ can yank it clear out. But this is what I'm talking about. When a group like this, LGBT or the pedophile, when they seek notoriety, what they don't want, they don't want it rooted out. They want it recognized and diagnosed as a problem to be it's part of their makeup. And before you know it, you'll hear this atrocity. God made me this way. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. But listen to me, look it up when you go home today. Pedophile for people who do un, 
unthinkable things to kids are seeking notoriety through the LGBT. Now, if we let the world define us, then it's going to come up to anything. They'll define us in any way, shape, or form. But if we allow the Bible to define what a good life is, if we allow the Bible to tell us what fame and fortune is, I would rather be famous for helping people that cannot help me back and that cannot help themselves than I would for coming up with a bunch of albums that hit number one for a certain amount of weeks and, and stuff like that. I mean, there, there's a big difference from how the world defines it. I mean, imagine this. If, if Jesus allowed the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious people of his day, to define him, then he would have became like them. And to be like them would be, I want to tell you what you want to hear. I want you to like me, so I'm going to tell you everything you want to hear. I, I'm going to come and tickle your ear at your house. We're going to have a good time. And you're going to give all kind of money to the church. And, and I'm going to wear the best things. And I'm going to, and, and, and I'm, we're just all going to grow together and stuff. And be no spirituality to it at all. Not in God's will at all. I mean, these guys in Jesus' time were, were hypocrites. You know, the last time I checked is when God, when Jesus was doing everything perfect, when Jesus was in God's will perfectly, the devil was still dancing over here and, and, and trying to tempt Christ to pull him away. So I'm, uh, this is not a message that once you get a biblical definition of what a good life is, it doesn't eliminate the devil. It doesn't. He's going to still tempt you through resources and things that's going to try to define to you what a good life is. And, and, and everything. So don't let that happen. We're going to look in a scripture in Matthew and it's going to define for us what a good life is. And it's going to tell us some things I think it's important for you to catch this morning. I don't know about you, but I've already got a lot out of this series and Plan to give a bunch more. This is uh, the third part. Next Sunday will be our last part. But in, in this Sunday, we bring, God brings us to Matthew chapter 6. And He wants us to understand these uh, several verses here. So as we read, let us, let us look for what God's trying to bring about out of this. It says to us right off the bat, Do not store up for ourselves treasures on earth. Where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. If you've ever been a victim of a burglary, it's offensive for someone to break in your house and take what you work for. And this is what Christ is trying to say. Do not build up treasures for yourself on earth where, where, these, where thieves can come in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. That's a big deal. Verse 22, another big deal. The eye is the lamp of the body. And if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are, are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. When some version says you cannot serve both God and man. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, and yet we do. Or about your body, what you will wear. Is not your, your, your life more than food and your body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Quite the contrary, doctors say, by worrying so much, we take from our life. But the scriptures are saying, by worrying, can we add a single hour to our life? The 
That's rhetorical. No. And why, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? I think that's the key. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first, here's key, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. You see, there's, a, there's an action on your part, and then a reaction by God. God cannot and will not, by his very nature, He's a gentleman. He, he does not compulse you or force you to love Him or serve Him. God will, by nature, wait for you to act towards Him by faith, in prayer, in fasting. And by doing those things, God's going to react to you. And His Word confirms that. He says, but seek ye first the kingdom of His righteousness, and of all these things will be added to what things? Provision. He will see you through. He will make sure you've got raiment or clothing. He will make sure you have food and shelter. He will make sure you have what you need. But He cannot ensure these things until first you take an action step. You've got to take a step closer to Him. God cannot break anything in your life until you give it to Him. I mean, He can, but He won't until you give it to Him. He can't heal your marriage until you give it to Him. He can't heal your friendship until you, you give it to Him. He can't deal with your children because they're running them up until you give Him your children. He cannot take action until you take action. That's as simply as that. That's what that scripture confirms. But seek ye first the kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. You know what else I, I pick up from that scripture? It told me at the beginning to store up treasures in heaven. Well, the last time I checked, as a common sense person, you know, every year, me and Lyle, we, we, we can beans, we can things, right? And, and we store it up for the winter, and we use it through the winter, right? So, if, if, if I'm storing up things in heaven, I'm, I'm going to come back to that. At some point, I'm going to reap it. I'm going to harvest it. Well, when am I going to harvest it? When I stand before God? And I'll get my reward. When I take and I help so and so and don't expect anything in return, I just canned it and stored it in heaven where, where no one's going to take it from me. And if I did it out of the right heart, right mind, when I stand before God and God says, Isaac, when you helped X, uh, X, Y, and O, uh, and you did this out for my glory and you did it for me and you expect nothing in return, it was simply because you understand I bought you with a price and, and you wanted to serve me and, and, and for my glory, it was no glory of anybody else's or your own, here's your reward. And then there may be some things that God says, Isaac, you stored this up, but you did it out of the right heart. Wrong heart and wrong mind. You sought glory from man. You had your reward back then. So you don't get nothing for that. And so I will be judged before the judgment seat of Christ for the good deeds that I've done. You understand? The decision's already been made. I'm saved. I'm in. Christ died for me. I do not work to get into heaven. You understand? Grace got me in. I couldn't earn that. I couldn't work enough for it. So I'm already in heaven through my acceptance of Christ. Okay? But then there comes the part of my works. My works is based off my belief. My, my behavior is based off my belief. See? And I do what I do because Christ... Uh, directs me to do it. Alright? When someone hits me on my left cheek, I turn to them the right one. When someone says, how many times am I supposed to forgive you? What Jesus said? Not once, not twice, but 77 times 7. 
It's a point that needs to be made. That, so when I score up stuff, uh, we talked at the beginning of the message that as much mercy as Isaac gives, Isaac will receive. So if I'm being merciful to Paul Eddie, uh, then God's going to show me mercy on the day of judgment. If I am not merciful to Paul Eddie, then I am robbing myself of the mercy that can come my way, as we all need mercy. Amen? Amen? Amen. Alright, now another thing that spoke out to me while I was reading the scriptures is it says something about your eyes. Now, when I was thinking my eyes, uh, you've heard the phrase, the eyes are the windows to the soul. Well, this is why, because when it says if, that your eye is a lamp, uh, is a lamp of the body, what's it trying to say? What you see, what you read, and the pictures you look at, all these things affect you, for the good or for the worse. You can read more romantic novels, paperbacks, all you want. If you don't pick up the Bible, I say you're getting the wrong message. I, matter of fact, you are getting the wrong message. My grandfather, God rest his soul, who lived in Ohio, uh, on my dad's side, he had volumes, volumes. I mean, it must, it could have been a whole room, bookshelf, nothing but questions, volumes. And when I first got saved, God brought me back in memory of that because when we go up to see him, I'm just being all all the books he had read. You know, some of them that thick, some of them that thick, but. They were wall to wall, ceiling to floor. All of what he read. I'm thinking, when I got saved, I started rethinking things. You know, you're reborn, right? So I started rethinking things, and I thought about that. Not condemning him, but this is the thought I had. If I had enough time to read all those books, and even be caught up in series of books, you know how they make uh, one book and it bases off, and you've got three or four more persons from that one book, uh, how much Bible could Pat got in him had he not read those books and he read the real book? Had we not entertained our time with fantasy and fiction and we read the real book, the Bible, how much more God can we get in us? And I, and I know that Christians do this today that with their eyes. They read so many things that they ought not to. And I know with Christians, they get on the uh, get on the computer or they get on things and they see things they ought not to. And I know that as Christians, when they turn on the television, they watch things they ought not to. And so, at the end of the day, if you've got 8,900 seconds in a day, I think that's the number. How many of those seconds are being used for God? Minus your sleep time, minus, you know, stuff like that. I think the Bible's trying to tell you it's what you see, kind of, kind of dictates how you feel and where you go. And if you want to write these points down, I think it's worth mentioning. I want to talk to you this morning about greed. Greed. Um, you know, the people come to me oftentimes and confess many things. But I have never come across anybody that had sat down in the office or called me on the phone and admitted to the point that I spend too much money on myself. I think my greedy lust for money is harming my family and my soul and my people around me. I've never had that happen. And I think I would be gullible and stupid to think that greed has not found its hooks in the some Christians. So therefore, I can only come up with one conclusion, that greed is a weapon of the devil that is very subtle and deceitful and hidden. And until you purposely call it out, sometimes you might not even know it's there. I think greed can be hidden under innocent phrases like, well, I work very hard for what I got. I think it can be hidden under phrases.
phrases like that. I think greed could be hidden under innocent phrases like, well, if I give you this, I won't have enough for my kids. Did we not just read where your treasure is there where your heart also be? Or did we not just read that, that if we trust in God, all these other things will be added to us? Did we not read last week, not let the left, left hand know what the right hand is going? To give as we're prompted by the Spirit to give? So if we start putting conditions on uh, giving, then we're really saying we don't trust in God. I do not think that God will put you in the poorhouse in your efforts to help the needy. That is counterproductive. That is counter God. God doesn't do that. God wants to bless you, not curse you. God wants to build you up, not take you down. God, and there are people out there sitting behind the televisions today, even right now, being deceived by TV evangelists saying, send me all you got. Send me all you got. God's given me this. And poor soul would do just that. And put themselves in the poorhouse. Now you say, Pastor, what about what about the, the, the widow woman that gave the one penny and Jesus was standing by and said, Well, she gave him more than everybody. He said that not because she was poor. He said that because she gave out the right heart and mind. That she wasn't attached to that one mic, that one penny. She wasn't attached to it. She didn't allow it to dictate her decisions. She knew her faith was in God. That's what that story's about. It's not about making sure you're so spiritual that you give everything you have just so you can go to the mission and eat and sleep. That is a lie from hell. We don't do that. Greed is a deceptive thing in America. We don't even recognize it. When people from foreign countries come to America, they say we're the richest country they've ever seen. Matter of fact, take some of the poorest people in our American country and take them over to, or, or the foreign people see them, they call them rich. You understand what I'm saying? That's why when our teens and when our young people or anybody goes on a mission trip over to some foreign place where you got to walk to get the water and you got to live in mud huts and stuff like that, the reason it's so impactful is because you start to wake up to the greed that has plagued our nation. And you start to realize how good you have. That's the impact. Then you come back fully changed. Why? Because your eyes grow. But I'm here to tell you right now that your eyes can be open this morning to the fact that we have a good life whether we're going through the trials and tribulations of life. We've got a good life whether we're hanging on the cross like Christ was or not. We have a good life. A good life is not defined on some salty beach in Margaritaville. It's not that. It's not having your barns full and your money and your wallet full. It's not a, that's not a good life. That means you have resources that God blessed you with. That's all that means. Your good life depends upon your faith in God. You know, 1 John chapter 2, verse 16, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Ecclesiastes 5.10 Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. The two is meaningless. Listen, let me read that again. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Guess what? When I sat down with the state police to be interviewed and processed and tested to, to get in, I agreed with everything. From the hourly wage to the benefits. When you sat down with your employer, you agreed with the hourly wage and the benefits. But you know what? It ain't three months later after we get the job, we're starting to complain about how much we make. We're starting to complain how much better ideas we got than the boss's ideas. It's amazing how the devil flips his turn and turns his head. We are desperate for a job. We get the job. Then we complain about the job. Greed is a very deceptive thing. 
Now, if you, if you allow me a moment, the second point I'd like to talk to you about is I'd like to talk to you about God versus man. God versus not necessarily money in and of itself, but God versus the worldliness. That's what mammon is defined as worldliness in the Jewish time. Um, it's, but the reason I want to talk to you about this is because Jesus says it's impossible to serve both. You either love the one and hate the other. That means if you love the worldliness, you're going to hate God. Then he says, you will, uh, you will despise the one and be devoted to the other. So if you're devoted to man and worldliness, then you despise God. I don't know about you, but as a Christian, that's, that's very counterproductive to hate God and despise God. So we've got to get this God versus man thing right. We got to get. We got to make it. Uh, we got to settle it today. Who we serve? It's either the world or God. I hope what you got on today wasn't a decision made by celebrities. I hope what you got on today was a decision that you asked God about. Because you serve God, you don't serve the world. We're not a trendy Christian group. Has anyone ever worked two jobs, three jobs? You know that only lasts so long. You get to wear yourself out. You get to have a nervous breakdown. You get to, get to, you know, I used to work two and three jobs. When I, me and Lyle first got married, we had a thing. You know, I had a, a mouth to feed, a couple mouths to feed, a home to provide for. And, uh, when I first graduated high school, I just did whatever, you know, two or three jobs. And, and I went from one job to the next job. You know, it wasn't too long before I started feeling the effects of that. And, 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 you know, at the end of the day, it still wasn't really enough compared to the cost of living and the things that was needed. I think we had the things that were needed. It's just the contentment part that we, we didn't have them, right? We had clothes on our back, we had food in our stomach, a roof over our head and stuff. We still lacked some things that would have made life easier. But the point of it is, we're working two or three jobs just wore me plumb out. Now I think Jesus wants us to learn something from this. There are some people just wearing themselves out for provisions, for certain things in life. That when you take a step back, God says you should be content. You shouldn't be wanting so much. Because you know what? I'm your God. I know exactly what you need. If I thought you needed that, I would have done provided it for you. But you know what? You can do without that. So, when I look at God versus man, when I look at that, I'm thinking to myself, if I'm busy serving God and then following the world, I'm going to get wore out. I ain't going to know which way is up north or south, my morals, my ethics will be compromised. If I'm not devoted to one or the other, I'm going to try to be a soup sandwich. Everybody eating a soup sandwich? You can't. You can't eat a soup sandwich. I'm picking that thing up. It's fall apart. It's a mess. Your life is going to be a soup sandwich. Spiritually. You're not going to know which way is up. You know, where God's word is black and white, it's going to be gray to you. Ah, uh, well, yeah, I've seen that, but I see that. Uh, uh, no, God is black and white, I'm and this is one of them. You cannot serve God and the world. You can't do it. It's impossible. And fully satisfy your commitment to Christ. You can't do it. You'll be pulled in so many directions. You'll be busy trying to please two bosses. You'll be worn out. Decisions will be, will be confusing. Commitments will be different than God. I mean, God says you need to serve one or the other. He'll leave us. I mean, He says serve Him fully and wholeheartedly, right? But at the end of the day, He gives you the decision. You either serve this or you serve me. You serve the world or you serve me. You're either hot or you're cold. He gives you the decision. What an awesome, merciful God. So that when we stand before Him on that day of judgment, we condemn ourselves. James chapter 1, verses 1 through 8 says, 
James, the servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. Consider it your pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. What in the world? That is topsy-turvy. That is upside-down thinking. What do you mean? Do I got to be happy when I get through trials? Do I got to smile? Because it don't feel very good. And it's not very pleasant when I go through trials. But this is why Jesus says that when we do go through trials of many kinds, we know that it's the testing of our faith that builds perseverance. It produces perseverance. We all need perseverance in today's world. You know, I was talking to Brother Plum back here uh, this morning. I said, you know what? Thank God for trials and temptations. Thank God for that. Because it really lets us know where we stand in our faith. It lets us know where we stand. It's, it's easy to serve God when things are good. Food on the table, clothes on our back, roof over our head, everything's hunky dory. Job is good, no threat of layoff. Everything's good. It's easy to serve God that way. When it's not, it's when trials come. When it's not so very hunky dory. When life is a soup sandwich. That's when we start realizing where our faith is, doesn't it? We start praying more. We start looking to God more, or maybe less. Maybe, maybe we're on the opposite end of that. Maybe we, we start trying to take it in our own hands and start controlling the situation and start saying, God, no, I got this, God. And then we start messing things up even more. Or we're trusting in God. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any one of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives it generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given unto you. But when you ask, here's another thing we've seen earlier in the beginning of Scripture. You must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. The person who should should not expect, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. You serve God and mammon. You serve God and the world. You will be unstable and double-minded. And I do not trust you because you serve two masters. We should serve one. When you walk out of here this morning, it should be made up in your mind that you're either going to serve God or the world. Make it up. We're out of time. We're out of time. The world is coming to an end. Maybe not tomorrow. Maybe not. Right? I don't know. But I know all prophecy is being fulfilled. I do. And the Word of God is being spread like never before. And more accessible than ever before. And that is the last thing that needs fulfilled. Everything else has been fulfilled. We are out of time. The second to the last thing I want to reveal to you is the wrong attitude to have. The dangers of riches are often mentioned in the New Testament, but nowhere are they condemned in and of themselves. And what Jesus condemns here is the greed, the hoarding of the money and the resources that we have. If Christ was focused on the resources and the power and the money, then he would have failed on the mountaintop when the devil showed him all the kingdoms of the world and said, I will give all this unto you if you would just bow down and worship me. He said, get behind me, Satan, for I shall worship God, and him only shall I serve. And he passed the test. Can you? The tests of Jesus were not only meant for Jesus to pass, they're meant for you to pass. Because in our own little way, the devil takes us onto our own little mountains. And the things that we desire, the treasure the most, is what the devil will show us. He said, I'll give you all these things if you would just follow me. Follow the world. And some of us have compromised. And some of us, not so much. Luke chapter 12 says, Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide his inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge and an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. And when Jesus says, watch out, you better watch out. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. 
Life does not consist in abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. I just had a thought. Let me back up. And he told them, uh, life does not consist in abundance of possessions. Do you know how many parents are going out of their way and even making themselves broke so that they can provide everything their children want? Want. The children are not the parents here. The parents need to be the parents. We do not go out and rush to the store and buy the nearest gadget just so our kids will be happy and it puts us in the poorhouse. We got to teach them responsible spending, responsible, accountable spending, saving. And just because something new comes out, don't mean they need it. Matter of fact, probably the best lesson is that they work for, build up the funds, not drain their whole fund, but build up the funds to go get what they desire. After prayer. After they pray about it. Okay? So I just, I just wanted to throw that in there. Sometimes we... We go out there and we get abundance of possessions because our kids want us to. It's verse 16. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there will I store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many, for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. This was his attitude. But God said to him, and this is what you should know, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. See, this guy was so busy about storing, his mindset was storing up to keep him for himself that he had some years of provision that God wanted him to live for the here and now. God wanted him to see the needs of each day and because of how God blessed him, meet those needs. It had nothing to do, nothing to do with making sure he was comfortable for years to come. See, God don't want you to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow may come, and when it does, it'll have enough worries and concerns that come with it. Matter of fact, your trouble begins when your eyes open. Each and every morning. Let me tell you, God is the God of the here and now. God wants you to deal with yourself and Him and the devil right now in this moment. Because an hour from now, life as we know it can be done. And he said earlier, what can we add? An hour to our life by worrying? No. Let tomorrow worry about itself. It'll come. You worry about the time you're in right now. The last thing I bring up to you to the, uh, this morning is we talked about the wrong attitude. I'd like to mention to you about the right attitude. And it is, um, if you can't, the devil's going to help you justify anything, but God will call you out to do the right thing. See, the devil's always in your ear trying to compromise your faith. Trying to compromise the Word of God and its effectiveness in your life. We read a couple main scriptures that said, and based and keyed on two things. Or one thing in each one. It was your faith. Don't expect anything from God if you doubt it. And by faith, we are to seek God out first. But the devil is always going to be there in your ear trying to convince you of a compromise. And you don't, you know, yeah, God said He's going to provide for you and stuff, but you need to go out here and do this and do that and do that and, and hurry up. I mean, look at your kids, look at your family. He'll try to get you to handle the situation all by yourself instead of you trusting in God in prayer and direction. God will move you out of the pews and cause you to action. He's not going to let you see, be there to be a pew potato. He's going to call you to action and, and, and uh, move in the right direction. And, but the devil's job is to move you out of the realm that God has provided and into the realm that you're providing. Philippians 2 5 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ. In your relationships 
with each other have the same mindset of Christ. What a big bill. What a tall order. To have the mindset of Christ. If it wasn't accomplishable, it wouldn't be there. And what you think is impossible is possible with God. Put on the mind of Christ in everything. Your attitude and mindset of money means everything as Christians. Because the love of it is the root of all evil. Your attitude and mindset about what you have means everything. Your mindset and attitude about what you don't have means everything. Your mindset and attitude about God means everything. There are so many things that's combating your faith in God if God exists. I mean, after all, look what man is doing. Creating life. Taking life. Stem cell research. Creating life. We talked about that on our series of God on Film. How, like the Tower of Babel, man is trying to accomplish and accomplish and accomplish and accomplish and accomplish and before you know it, they become gods themselves in their mind. And if you put your trust in man, in that regard, you will fail. You will fail. What if Jesus' mindset and attitude wasn't in line with God's when, when he was taken up to that mountaintop? Now, I don't know about you, but I, I've never heard about a plan B for salvation. It was always Jesus Christ born of a virgin and, 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 and by the Spirit of God, and He came to redeem the man. The whole Old Testament talked about Messiah coming and all this stuff. God with us, right? I never heard about plan B. This had to work. This meant everything. And as Jesus cried and his, his, his sweat turned into blood and, and his heart was about to beat out of his chest and he, he'd rather not go to the cross and endure all that, he did. As he endured the temptations of the devil, he never once turned around and said, well, I'm sorry, sorry guys, the devil made me do it. He never failed. He always had his focus on God. So if the Bible says to put on the mind of Christ in Philippians, then we ought to pull and put on the mind of Christ. Will you stand with me? Let me leave you with this. Hebrews 13, verse 5. It says, keep your, keep your lives free. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. That's what He said. If you believe God this morning, if you believe the Word of God this morning, then you have to leave here this morning with the decision, I'm going to serve God, or I'm going to serve the world. Or with the decision, that I'm going to be content with what i got. And none of what I got belongs to me. It belongs to God. And I will always go to God to dictate where those things will go. Where those things will be invested. Your time, your resources. You've already made a decision this morning. I'm going to take my time this morning. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to hear God's word. I'm going to see what he has to say to me this morning. Oh, that's wrong. God gave you a gift of 86,400 seconds today. Have you used one of them to say thank you? I'll leave you with that. This is you and God. This is you and Him. The rubber meeting, the road brass tax thing. This is you bowing your head for a moment. Go ahead, bow your head for a moment. And you really asking God to deal with yourself. Say, God, reveal to me the things that is not part of you. Reveal to me where is that greed in my life that exists. If it exists, God, let's root it out. You and me together, let's root this greed out of my life. Let's take care of it now. In the name of Jesus, I don't, do not want it to come in between me or you. Take it out. I don't want to serve two masters. Tell God that. I don't want to serve two masters. I want to serve you. I don't want to serve the world. I don't want to serve money. I want to serve you.
precious Heavenly Father, Lord God, we come to you in humility, Lord God, and just ask you to pour your life into us. You've already given your best, Lord God, and, and, and right now we come up short. In our best efforts, we come up short. Lord God, I just ask right now in the name of Jesus, Lord God, make us transparent. Reveal unto us the things that need rooted out. And may you draw each and every one of us closer to you. In Jesus' name.